sorry, we're recording this event, so I'm just giving the man up there a <laughs> thumbs up. Um, welcome everybody to um, SOAS and to the Japan Research Centre. I'm Helen McNaughton and I'm Chair of the Japan Research Centre at the moment. Um, I'm not going to say very much except to say thanks for coming along, um, but I really do need to thank uh, Toshiba International Foundation who have uh, sponsored this um, event for us tonight. And also thank everybody for coming um, a long way. So, uh, two of our speakers have come from Japan tonight, so I'm going to speak first. And then we have Machiko Osawa, she's from Japan Women's University in Tokyo. And then uh, Peter, who didn't come quite so far, Peter Matanle from Sheffield University, our friends up north. Um, and then we have Jun, Uma, Jun Imai, who's come all the way from Sapporo, from Hokkaido University. And uh, we, um, we've just all been in Lisbon, as you know, as many of you have been in Lisbon at the European Association for Japanese Studies Conference, and gender was a very hot topic in some of the panels that we went to. Um, Actually, Jun, Peter and I are working on a book on um, employment uh, at the moment and, and Machiko is our guest speaker because our um, other uh, co-collaborators can't be here. But also, I think it's really important when we talk about gender to not just talk about women because often when you read about gender, it's just, it just, just means women. So I was very conscious that we need to talk about men. So we've got two males talking about men tonight, which I think is a nice gender balance already. So if only life was always like this, um, two women, two men, two Japanese, two non-Japanese talking about women and men in Japan. So that's what we're going to try and deliver for you. We're going to try and keep it short and snappy, 15 minutes each. That will give us lots of time for um, discussion. Um, we welcome comments as well as questions. Um, and then most importantly, Toshiba has very kindly sponsored drinks as well. So there are drinks and canapes even, I think, after the, the session, which should be about 7.45. So um, I'll get underway. So I'm going to give um, an overview, really. Um, as it said, three decades of gender equality legislation in Japan. And I'm asking this question, which I'll explain now, is there a gender dividend for Japan? And this is a theoretical framework. Um, the idea of a gender dividend is a recent um, concept in the gender and development theory. And it really focuses on increasing economic opportunities for women and also enabling a country or an economy or even a business or a company to reap that dividend. So for developing nations, it's obviously about empowering women, giving them access to uh, very basic things like education. But for advanced nations, which Japan is, of course, it's about enhancing the fuller integration of women into the workplace, making sure there's no discrimination, encouraging leadership, and importantly, harnessing the benefits of d gender equality and diversity for business. So this is very applicable to Japan today, particularly as we know that womenomics is a big, again, it's just womenomics, it should be gendernomics perhaps, but womenomics is a big focus in Japan today. So what I'm asking, therefore, is... Is there a gender dividend for Japan taking place? Um, but what I, before I answer that question, I would like to suggest that up until recently, or perhaps throughout the post-war decades, um, Japan has harnessed this very developmentalist gender dividend of difference rather than equality. And that's because I'm sure you're very familiar with the way that the post-war um, employment system has been structured. I'm not going to talk about male employment, the left-hand side, because Peter is going to talk about that. But if we think about female employment, we know it's been quite different to men's employment. So often under the assumption that they won't stay as long as men, um, that they will become non-regular workers later in life, that they may resign at marriage and childbirth, that um, you know, childcare in the home takes um, first priority, if you like. And this very important issue that if they opt for part-time employment, particularly as working mothers, they have a very predictable working day, very controlled working hours, which is in, in very sharp contrast to men, which um, Peter will talk about. And really within the idea that the female is the dependent in the household, so the male is breadwinner and the female is dependent. So um, what has been the impact of that dec those decades of difference, if you like, or segregation? Well, we know that men and women work very differently in Japan in terms of female, uh, female and male labor participation rate. So work, uh, women work in the very famous M curve where they drop out for several years during the peak child uh, rearing uh, years and men stay in employment their whole entire lives. 
Um, so you can see with the blue line that this M curve was very well established in the, by the year that the um, Equal Employment Opportunity legislation came in. Um, uh, equal Employment Opportunity legislation, yeah. So by the time that uh, Equal Employment Opportunity legislation came in, that M curve was very well established uh, by 1985. Um, the other difference is that women work, um, uh, there are 25 to 30% not working in the labour market. So if you see that almost 90% of, or 95% of men are working, you can see that above the red line, 25 to 30% of women are not working in the labour market. So it's referred to as this underutilisation of very, as we know very well, educated women in Japan. So those are the two key differences, the patterns of work and the underutilisation of women. Now, the, um, I won't say it again, the EEOL was mm -hmm. enacted in 1986, it's 2017 now, so we now have a good 30 years of a gender equality movement in Japan, which is what we are trying to assess. So I think there's a real tension between this dividend that Japan has, it's worked very well for Japan, arguably, throughout the post-war years to have women primarily responsible for the domestic and men primarily responsible for productive economy, economic labour, but now I think there's this real tension between what the EEOL has been trying to usher in ever since the 80s, a tension between difference, the dividend of difference, and the dividend of, of equality in Japan, and I think we're seeing that play out. One of the first ironies of the legislation was that companies were immediately sort of went into enacting separate career tracks for, for women and men. So, as you know, men were often put onto sogo shoku, um, what do you call that, uh, professional track, and women onto ipan shoku, the clerical track in companies. So that was a real irony of a legislation that was supposed to be bringing in equality, but that was allowable under um, the legislation. So, and also within the framework, I'll go into it a bit more, but there's a real tension because of this preservation of the male breadwinner, female dependent model in Japan, and we'll go into how that's being preserved politically and within companies. The, um, the, the legislation has been strengthened, of course, since 1985. They strengthened it in 1997, again in 2006. We have seen progress in the sense, and much is going to go into progress a bit more and barriers, but we have seen higher female labour participation rate. However, we do know that there are still very low rates of women in management. In fact, Japan is the bottom of all the OECD countries in terms of rates of women in management. Uh, we also know that 68% of all non-regular workers are, are women, are female. Um, and also, I think one of the most important um, tensions or criticisms are, that you can have of the EOL is it still allows for discrimination by marital status. So it's perfectly acceptable to put married women into non-regular work, to give men higher wages because they're the household head. All these kinds of things play out because the legislation is not as tight as you might think when you think about equal opportunities. And, and marital status is one of the key uh, tensions there, I think. So um, what does it mean? Some people say that there is progress because the M curve is flattening. I would suggest that that doesn't always, you can't always assume that that's progress. For example, um, you can, we know that women are less likely to drop out in those peak reproductive um, age cohorts, which is a good thing. So more women are staying um, in the labour market, but we also know that women are having fewer babies, so there are fewer women opting out to have babies as well, so we have to take that into account. Um, and when we look at whether they um, stay in continuous employment after having their child or, or whether they resign, uh, things are still a little bit status quo. So um, women, the, the continuous means women who continue in employment after having their first child, so one year after having their first child, they're still in the same job or with the same employer. That has gone up since 1985, and we would expect that because childcare leave has come in and, and maternity rights have strengthened. So that's good. On the other hand, the percentage who resign upon their first child, quit their jobs, has really not gone down that much. So 34% of women still resign um, 30 years later. So there's not a lot of movement there. And actually, if we take into account those who are not working at all, 47% um, of women are not in the labour market after their first child. So it's still almost half uh, women having a child not working after the first year. And we also know that the increased female labour participation rate overall, which is seen as progress, is really driven by older women working and particularly as non-regular workers. So 
actually the percentage of women overall, all Japanese women in regular employment, has actually declined over 30 years because there's more women working in non-regular categories. So there's lots of stuff going on that suggests that the M-curve movement is not always as a movement towards gender equality. If we break it down by a company, I think this is quite interesting that the M-curve is driven by medium and large organisations. So the red is medium companies and the large is green companies. And you can see there's a definite M there. So medium and large firms employ women at relatively high levels in the 20s, but they tend to drop out in the 30s. Whereas if you look at the blue, the small companies, there's no evident M curve, probably because they employ a lot of non-regular workers in, in older life. Um, so we can suggest that women hit some kind of wall in corporate Japan. If you think of corporate Japan as big organisations, medium organisations, and this seems quite strange if we think about it in other OECD countries where big companies can offer more scope for flexible working, for careers, for coming back um, into different positions. So I think in Japan we see something different happening than perhaps is happening elsewhere in the world in terms of the scope for career opportunities in large organisations. And so we still, we still have this very persistent divide. This is a breakdown by non-regular workers. So this is all non-regular workers by age and sex. The pink is women, sorry for gendering it, the blue is men. Um, so we see very large, high levels of non-regular employment in the very oldest workers. But some of the ma male workers are shokutaku. They've retired out of lifetime employment onto t temporary contracts. So they're not really non-regular workers. We see very high percentages of non-regular work in young workers, which we know that young workers are increasing in, in um, non-regular employment. But I think what's interesting is that there are very low levels of non-regular work for men in the peak productive years. So if you look at the blue on the right, say between the ages of 25 to 55, particularly in the 30s, 40s, most men are in, uh, only 10% of, or less than 10% of men are in non-regular employment, which means 90% of men are in regular employment. So it's very divided when you compare it with women. So I think there is still that significant gender divide taking place. But we need to monitor very carefully what's happening with young men, because young men, regular work is increasing, and, and June's going to talk about men and non-regular work, so that's um, one of our later presentations. So what are the barriers? I think we can break it down into the politics and the environment and the institutional models that are around. And we can also break it down into what's happening in the workplace. So we're all going to delve into this in various ways. I'm not going to answer all of these uh, questions right now. But I will say that politics does play a role. Um, the idea of gender equality is arguably a top-down sort of pressure anyway. Um, and the institutional framework is quite top-down still as well. So we still have these gender norms, for example, even when Abe is talking about womenomics last year, he said a typical family, husband working full-time, women working part-time. He just assumes that women will only work part-time. Everybody criticised him for getting the wages too high. These are very unrealistic wages. Nobody criticised him for assuming that the woman would only be a part-time worker under womenomics. So that was quite interesting. Also, the classic spousal tax debate. The spousal tax has been around since 1961. It caps married women's income. It, you're allowed to discriminate by marital status, as I said. The LDP said they're going to reform it, but really they're just raising the, uh, adjusting the um, threshold. So th this tax really incentivizes married women to cap their income, but also it puts pressure, nobody talks about this so much, it puts pressure on men to be, married men to be the breadwinner. And so the tax incentive is to keep those male breadwinner dependent roles. How does it play out? Well, Peter's going to talk about how core lifetime employment practices are still the model of, of many companies, particularly this issue of commitment. He's going to go into that, how men have to really commit, and women, if they have children, can't commit in the same way that men can commit in that kind of model. They can't do long working hours. Um, and when you look at what companies are doing, sometimes they just make these new, shorter working hours models for mo mothers only, which reinforces gendering. So only women with children can work flexibly. Everybody else has to work in the same uh, sort of model, if you like. So then they moan about you no know, having role models, remote working, not an option. Lots of uncertainty going on. Uncertainty for men, but uncertainty for women as well. And Peter's going to go into that a bit more. Um, but what's, I think, a problem when you look at diversity and what's happening in Japanese companies, they're really targeting women. How do we get more women into the company? But they're not targeting how things can change for men. So if you look at that cartoon there, 
the man is given a career ladder and the woman's, the joke is the woman only gets a stool. But actually, the, if you flip it around, the man only gets one ladder to climb up and nothing else. So, you know, there's a real sort of gender difference still going on there. So I think we're only seeing sort of slow incremental progress for women. I think we've still got that dividend playing out of difference. If we want, if Japan wants equality, it needs to target male work-life balance very much so, and it needs to change a lot of the, the institutions. Um, does, do Japan really, does, do the Japanese really want to do that? That's a big question, I think. I don't know if I have the answer to that. We could talk about bottom-up movements. But I think the real push for changing it top-down is because they haven't got enough people anymore, so they're, they're having to change it. So I think there's a lot going on there. But I think um, in terms of allocating time to productive domestic labour, strong gender norms of difference are still got a big status quo in Japan. So I think there, that tension is the, the arm wrestle. Nobody's winning the arm wrestle at the moment, I don't think. Thank you. 15 minutes, was it? <laughs> Now we have Machiko talking about women again, but going into it in a bit more detail. Hello, everybody, and thank you for coming. And the, uh, I'm uh, sort of this topic is not new. <laughs> and I uh, I wrote the PhD thesis 30 years ago about the uh, working women in Japan in comparison with the uh, U.S. And so now the 30 years and nothing has been changed. This is sort of uh, it seems to be that then that uh, today I'm just talking about the uh, some changes happening. So <laughs> and the. Uh, the, the three topics I'd like to talk about, and first is just the, uh, the barriers for women to enter and the career progression in workplace. And the other uh, second topic, examples of the companies trying to change system and empower women. And then third is just the small signs of activism and women's changing uh, women's attitudes in university uh, grads. So that's the three topic within 15 minutes, and I try <laughs> to, to talk about as much as possible. So this is the uh, first figure that the uh, university graduate students, how many quit the job? And uh, this, you see that the Japanese women quitting the uh, job is quite high, and this is one of the reasons why that the company can't really invest women the same with men and this is like uh, the investment is waste and then uh, compared to US and Germany so that yeah we looked at the figures uh, sort of why women quit and the, uh, the company thinks because of the child care problem or the caregiving problems and then uh, looking at the reasons that uh, uh, this, this is a U.S. study found that uh, yeah, most of the women, uh, uh, the university graduate women, uh, s quit the job due to job dissatisfaction and the feeling that dead end, uh, you know, about their career. So it this seems to be what is going on is that uh, probably when the 30 years ago the women quit because they want to get married have a mother you know being mother but uh, yeah right now they just uh, the more women they uh, can see the future at the japanese corporation and quitting and so this is what we call the self fulfilling prophecy so it's not just this this set uh, statistical discrimination actually is working against the company, losing the uh, talented uh, women. So the another is, th this is the uh, uh, comparison uh, of the uh, wage uh, distribution of men and women, and we see the uh, big gap in the uh, lower level and the top level. The uh, upper level is because of the glass ceiling that uh, women cannot get to, you know, they cannot climb up the uh, ladder. But the uh, interesting thing is that the lower level that we see the gap, which is that we call the uh, wet floor, so that the uh, sticky floor doesn't allow women to climb up the career, uh, career ladder. So this is the uh, uh, so what is happening is that the uh, initial beginning of the career, there is a distinction between men and women to which course. And then I think uh, uh, Helen is talking about uh, Ippan Shoku and Sogo Shoku Managerial and uh, 
uh, clerical position so that the women stuck into the clerical position and difficult to get into the managerial position. So this is more like uh, due to the structural problem of the labor market rather than women's uh, intention to, you know, like uh, to be, want to be mother. So it's a demand side uh, problem. That's what we were, yes. Oh, sorry, this is a, we were uh, comparing the first one is just a row gap, and the different one is a structural problem. So, and then the uh, third is just the, within the, the same wage, you know, controlling by the structure. Capital, so that the uh, most of the difference is the return of the human capital. That is the structure of the labor markets. I, we can talk a little bit more, but uh, anyway. So this is a bit detailed study, and then the uh, so the new changes. But yeah, uh, I talked to my colleagues. Uh, so do you think some change is going on in cooperation? And then my colleagues says like, yeah, five years ago, some changes of the large cooperation and the. Yeah. Uh, what, what is this? so? So I, I'm giving you some examples of what is the change, and this is the uh, one of the large large uh, life uh, insurance firms uh, hiring eighty thousand employees, and the uh, uh, up until 1915. So as uh, Helen said, this is the. Uh, three tier or two tiers as a managerial, but man managerial position are divided between the two. That's uh, one is the top level is the one you, you are relocated anywhere. <laughs> and then the second one is that somehow you are confined to the area you're working, but the still you are able to do the sort of like a climb up the career ladder. And then the third one is associate, so-called associate, which is the uh, clerical work. And then the, most of the women are assigned into the clerical position. So the uh, uh, career uh, prospects is limited. And however, at uh, year 2017, then changes the system. They abolish the associates. And so they uh, have only two. And the women are mostly into this area confined managerial course. And I asked them, so why do you change it? And they says, because the, the uh, Barbara economy burst in 1993 and the, uh, they did not hire enough male u university graduates. Uh, and so the, uh, now they were about like mid-40s. So we don't have enough candidates to be the senior manager. So we have to change to sort of increase more candidates pool into th th this sort of able workers. And so the women are the ones we try to integrate into the system. So they are changing. Uh, the, also the pay scale is changing to same job to same wage principle. That's what they say. And they showed me the uh, figures. And uh, so, so this is a, only one example. And the, uh, but there is some, I hear the another companies that the, uh, also try to change the uh, uh, money, employment system. And then saying the same reason because of the uh, uh, unbalance of the, I don't know, age distribution in the uh, corporation, certain group of the age uh, uh, is not enough to, to, you know, sort of uh, bring them to the top level. So somehow they have to do some adjustment or something like that. So that's what's sort of the things. And the other uh, studies that has been uh, published recently is the showing the greater variation of the company policies towards working mother. So that's the, uh, it is true overlooked uh, overall, the, still the Japanese companies not really figure out how to use women's talents and tapping talents so well. But if you look at the differences among, uh, the, among the companies, those who have uh, two key policies, uh, which is the uh, 
sort of work-life balance policies that the women are able to combine the work and child care. The other one is the gender equality policies. And if the two policies are worked well, then the company's profit is higher than the others. So, but the generous work-life balance policies, not enough. So he is suggesting, so the, the key is just a boss has to be there to increase the productivity. And Japan is suffering from the low productivity. So this is the one of the key issues that they want to integrate more women, but also want to increase the productivity. So this is the, the real issue and difficult, but try to do. And this is the way we suggest you should do. And the other thing is just the, uh, five minutes, okay, that the, uh, oh my goodness, uh, Shiseido, <laughs> Shiseido shock. <laughs> this is the uh, Shiseido introduced the uh, different system and making beauty consultant work longer hours and then the uh, uh, weekends. And so the, the, uh, everybody's so upset because Shiseido is so famous, the, uh, being so nice to working mother. And then there's a public discussion, and then the uh, sort of general uh, atmosphere is just, the, well, this is a time, so women should be empowered. So that, then I wrote, uh, I was interviewed and I wrote some uh, article says, yeah, the equality should, shouldn't be only at the workplace. Equality should be also achieved in household sector. So that was the only time I got some attention, <laughs> internet forum. Anyway, so th that is uh, the thing. So there is some the sort of the <laughs> efforts of the cooperation is changing. And then I did some interviews with uh, corporate managers and then president. And some are doing uh, the uh, empowering women, and some companies are introducing, uh, uh, encouraging male workers to take child care leave, which is wonderful, but only one week for everybody. And this is not enough. But my colleague said that changes corporate culture a little bit. And the PNG is offering free um, diversity management training course. I was sitting in, so they try to change the attitudes of managers and, and reduces the uh, unconscious bias. And then the Google is the one now sort of lending their I IT tools to uh, do the uh, home-based work. And then one of the interesting things is the manager has to take this opportunity to stay at home and do the uh, conference at home. And then the, that's also working in progress. And then the Ikubos project, which is the new one that's uh, saying that the uh, uh, supervisors uh, who support the subordinates to achieve work-life balance and, and then also produce the pro results. And so they, the, now that 136 corporations are supporting these ideas, and then the, uh, now we see the little bit of change of the retention of the uh, women uh, after giving birth, that because that 2010 there's a new registration that the company has to reduce working hours to two hours if the uh, workers request it. And this is a controversial uh, policy, but uh, yeah, definitely increase the retention. So has some different, making some differences. And also there was a, a, a tragic uh, uh, suicide by young women and the, uh, at the December 25th of 2015, which really shook uh, everybody. And that is now that the changing, try to change the work, work culture, but minimum policy change. So I think that uh, two other speakers will talk more about long working hours. So the signs of some activism, uh, very little, but uh, yeah, two is one, my students is involved, is uh, my former students is involved, and they went to the Suginami ward, the, the district ward, and they, uh, uh, arguing that uh, they should provide more uh, daycare. That is your duty <laughs> to do. And then the other one is the brog, that's the hoikuen uh, ochita nihon shinez, which is like, uh, I could not send my kids to uh, uh, public uh, daycare and uh, Japan dropped that or something like that. And, and then 
the first the diet members says like this is a ridiculous what ugly language they use but many women stood up say like i i'm the one I really feel this way and and then the, so th then the demonstration in front of diet and so that some changes is taking place about the attitudes and the women are no longer uh, feel think that uh, they're going to be the housewives either working but uh, dropped uh, when they raise children and then come back uh, or they continue to work so there's some attitudinal change so my conclusion is that the uh, the change in Japan may seem uh, small and insignificant compared to advances in the US and UK and they may not amount to a quiet revolution uh, but there is something going on and prospects for women's career seems a little bit brighter now than in the past and especially due to the very tight labor market and growing awareness on how Japan is missing out. Thank you very much. Can you do it? You can tell him in time. Uh, good evening, everyone, and um, thank you for coming. Thank you also to Helen for organizing this and um, for inviting me. I'm, it's, it's nice to come to SOAS and, and give a presentation. Um, it's something that I've been kind of working on and thinking about for, for a long time, but this is the first time I've ever really been able to talk about this topic. So um, it's a little bit text heavy, but um, that's because I'm just really starting out. This is the first time I'm ever going to talk about this in public. Um, <laughs> Because partly because it's it's such a controversial subject actually, um, so I'll I'll get straight into it. Um, it's really inspired by um, David Benatar's book, The Second Sexism: uh, Discrimination Against Men and Boys. He's a, a philosopher from University of Cape Town in South Africa, and uh, what the second se sexism is is that men experience different life chances and outcomes in specific areas. Some are obvious and some not. So, for example, men are overwhelming the majority vi of victims of violence, corporal punishment, death in armed conflicts, systemic bias in the cr criminal justice system, and so on. And although the majority of rich people are men, the, so are the majority of poor people. The majority of property owners are men, but also the majority of homeless are men. And men are much more likely to be substance abusers, smokers, uh, encounter mental illness, and so on. Um, and mel male health and life expectancy outcomes are systemically lower. So all of these are in part based on everyday assumptions about male gender roles in society. But his book was very, very much misunderstood when it was published in 2011. Uh, so, for example, Suzanne Moore's article, a really excoriating criticism of his, of his book, um, saying that the sexism, second sexism is just victim envy and so on. I think she really misunderstood what Benatar was trying to say. So what the sex, second sexism is not is male victim envy or me too masculinism. It's not more significant than sex, sexism against women and it's not a method to assert that sexism against women is justifiable. Um, so the first sexism and the more important sexism is that perpetrated against women. But uh, sexism against both women and men is a systemic outcome of everyday assumptions about women's and men's attributes, capabilities and it's overwhelmingly perpetrated by men against both women and men, and sometimes by women against women and men, and is therefore intersectional with class and race um, and, and other, other uh, forms of discrimination. And regardless of the gender of the perpetrator and the victim, it's still sexism. So um, what feminism is going for is uh, wants is genuine equality between women and men, and it's not a replacement of one set of privileges with another. And we can't expect to achieve gender equality, uh, genuine equality, by waiting for it to be bestowed from above. And it requires both women and men to join together and engage in struggle to protest against the rich and powerful, overwhelmingly men, to wrest equality from structured and gendered inequality. Okay. Simone de Beauvoir said that to carry off this supreme victory in her book, The Second Sex, which inspired Benatar's, the title of Benatar's book, 
among other things, and beyond their natural differentiations, differentiations unequivocally affirm their brotherhood, that men and women together should come, should come together to resist and reject and, and uh, sexism and establish equality, uh, genuine gender equality, which is what I'm going to try and talk about today. Examples in Japan abound of inequality between men and women and which are based upon Im implicit assumptions about gender. So, for example, in, in, in health outcomes, we can see that, um, for example, uh, the, the majority of... Um, uh, the, the issue of smoking is a very interesting one. So, for example, the, the tobacco industry um, uh, argues that pressure on women not to smoke is, is uh, a, a discrimination against women and, and prevents them from exercising their liberty, whereas, of course, um, the, the reverse, that men are not discouraged from smoking, re, uh, results in much higher mortality amongst men. And um, there's much, less, uh, much fewer government resources gone into discouraging men from smoking, and consequently, uh, men die younger and more often from lung cancer and so on. What about the employment system and, the employment, uh, and particularly lifetime employment? The normative assumption, Helen mentioned about this already, about gender relations in the Japanese workplace is that men are privileged by having unequal gender-based access to career-track lifetime employment positions. Women are therefore discriminated against by having less access, and it's principally men who are keeping, keeping women out of these roles. The original EOL of 86-87 ostensibly sought to achieve workplace equality, but as Helen said, it, it, it produced structured gender, gender inequality in the workplace by legitimating a div division between career track and clerical track regular employment. So, in the male employment system, I want to concentrate on the employment requirements of men once they're in regular employment. And those, these, these four points actually produce a structured uh, gender bias against men within regular employment. So here we have my principal question, which is, what if we start to understand that most men in Japan don't want to work like Japanese men? So why would women want to do so? And there's quite a lot of evidence to suggest that women actually don't want to work like men. So we look at this here, part-time workers, the, the white bar, to choose their own working hours. By far the majority of part-time workers in Japan want to cho choose non-regular employment because they want to choose their own working hours. The next highest is to defray educational and household, household expenses. But the next highest is to strike a better balance with home life and other activities. By far the majority of non-regular workers and even more of a majority of part-time workers, of course, are women. Large numbers of women are choosing, choosing not to go into regular employment because they don't want to do it, because of the requirements of the job. So the idea that we can somehow fashion uh, e equality in regular employment between men and women by attracting women into, into regular employment is actually not really a, a, a feasible idea because women are actually ch choosing in very large numbers just to avoid it. So we look at un regular employment requires workers to give unlimited commitment and flexibility, long working hours, an unpredictable working day, sudden and unlimited overtime demands, unpaid overtime, sudden and or d distant job transfers. And all of these things prevent uh, men from taking a full part in family formation and domestic work. Many men do want to take part in family formation and are not, not able to do so because of the requirements of their employment. And it's therefore discriminatory against them. So, for example, with long working hours, we can see the top three, the top three lines there are um, uh, age bands, men in their 20s, 30s and 40s, uh, the, the proportion of men required to work more than 60 hours a week. And the bottom three are, are female workers in regular employment. Uh, and then we see that, for example, uh, sudden and unlimited overtime demands and, and uh, unpaid overtime here, um, mostly uh, required of men in regular employment. About half of the overtime that men contribute is paid, and about half of it is unpaid. And uh, the numbers of hours uh, since 2011 has, has, has barely changed. We can see, for example, the numbers of cases where karoshi compensation was received um, has uh, ballooned since the late 1990s. I mean, there, there are some problems with interpreting the data here, but the vast majority of, of these cases are, 
are men who have died. Uh, uh, the government has, has accepted, the judicial system has accepted that they've died uh, of overwork from unreasonable demands by their employers. And we can see unpredictable career patterns with frequent job postings and transfers. So this is a, a career pattern for um, a, a major retail company in Japan, which requires at least four job transfers during, their, during the career service. Uh, two of them are to, probably to distant locations away from the family, and they're not uh, at, at precisely the time that the employee is, is, uh, would be uh, normally expected to take part in, in career formation. Uh, sorry family formation. And we see that here the extent of employee consent in company choices of transfer, uh, the, the, in company choices of transferees, uh, the, the bottom dotted line there is the proportion of employees where the, uh, the job transfer was made at the employee's consent. So here we're seeing that more than 95% of job transfers that are being made in Japanese companies are without the employee's consent. And again, predominantly men. So when we look, when we look at these issues to do with uh, working hours, um, overtime hours, and job transfers, by far the majority of employees that are being requested or actually ordered by their companies to, um, to contribute those, those commitments, unlimited commitment to their organizations are men. And that takes men away from family formation. It takes men away from um, uh, mother, many other activities in their lives that they'd like to be able to, co to, to in engage in. Um, uh, and um, of course, conversely, uh, women's working hours are controlled. Um, they're often, the, the majority of women are uh, not asked to do, um, not asked to engage in, in sudden overtime contributions. Uh, they're, the, the hours of work and, and the, the time that they are, they're required to arrive at work and leave work are much more predictable than, than for men. And, and of course, they're almost never required to be posted to distant locations uh, um, uh, in, uh, very suddenly. And, and in fact, uh, with, with, a lot of the, with a lot of the job transfers, um, employees are not informed officially of their job transfer to a distant location. When I talk about distant location, it might be to another country at the other side of the world. They're not informed officially of that transfer until about a one month before they have to leave. And of course, that is extremely disruptive for family life and for personal life. So implicit assumptions about male and female attributes, capabilities produce widely differing working lives. Neither women nor men in general desire these outcomes. Entrenched discrimination against men, the second sexism, exacerbates entrenched discrimination against women, the first sexism. So we see here contributions by men to household chores and, chores and childcare. Japan is by far the lowest contribution by men to, to domestic life amongst these countries. And I would argue, and quite a lot of people are arguing now, that one of the main reasons for this is not that men don't necessarily want to do it, it's just that they're too exhausted to be able to do so, or they're not even in the home because they're working in another country. So, Benatar's bravery, perhaps his foolhardiness, because of the criticism that, that has been uh, uh, leveled against him, is in trying to break the deadlock that has slowed the closing of the worldwide gender gap. The, the, sl the, the data I showed you on women not wishing to engage in regular employment is, is part of this issue of the, the worldwide gender gap, the, the closure of the worldwide gender gap that was expected in, when, when uh, the, the so-called women's liberation movement uh, really got going in the 1960s has slowed markedly because of these entrenched um, uh, uh, differences between male and female patterns of work and domestic life. What I'm arguing here for is the, the revisited part of the second sexism revisited is for a radical change in perspectives about women and men in the Japanese workplace that places men alongside women as co-workers, colleagues, sisters and brothers because the current situation is so entrenched in law, in institutions and structures, in everyday practices and their underlying assumptions and values. Or are we at a crossroads? By understanding the sexism that men experience, by revealing it, by talking about it, we can make the workplace more attractive for both women and men and equalize female and male contributions in the home too. So 
What I'm calling for is for men to speak out about their own experiences and what they want for themselves. And to speak out about the entrenched sex and, and men also need to speak out about the entrenched sexism that women experience and to take action to change institutions and practices for all of our benefit. Thank you. These men are very brave coming and talking about men <laughs> at SOAS. <laughs> <coughs> Ah, good evening. My name is Jun Imai. Um, uh, the title of my talk is this. The talk is basically about why young men in non-regular employment cannot have or maintain gender equal values and attitudes. Trying to understand that is very important, I think. I, I believe it is very important to include men to achieve gender equality in any society. Um, <clears throat> this is something we already talked a uh, little bit. Today, non-regular employment consists about 40% about of total employment expanded due to the due regulatory reforms of labor markets since the mid-1990s. In the 1980s, it was about 18%. At the time, it was not an issue for men because most of the non-regular workers were married, middle-aged women. For men, it was just about 7% in the mid-1980s literally none at the large firm sector. Um, but after the deregulation, it has risen to 20% today. Figure, uh, this figure shows the expansion that happens across all age cohorts among men, and it also shows that very clearly that the young cohorts are affected more by the reforms. In Japan, employers have strong preferences on hiring new graduates directly from schools are core as core regular workers for lifetime employment. So the failure of young people to seize such an opportunity can be expected to have important and long-lasting effects on their careers and lives. This figure attests such concern is not without ground. It divides the younger people into several birth cohort and show the percentage of non-regular workers at some points of their life stages. And you can see that if you took a look at the bottom, those, that's the, those who were born in 1968, they're 49 years old this year. It's just about five, six, seven percent of the non-regular workers among men. But if you take a look at the uh, a man born in 1980s, more than 20 percent are in non-regular employment segments. One of the problems of Japanese labor market is that once people are located in non-regular segment, it is extremely difficult to leave it and become regular workers. There is very weak channel to move back and forth between them. The problem is not simply the dual structure of the labor market, but the life courses are segmented into two tracks, privileged one and the deprived one. The uh, labor market reforms um, are expected to trigger cultural and lifestyle change, including the change toward gender equality among Japanese men, especially in younger generations. It is expected to cause such a change as the existing culture was developed in close association with the development of employment and the arrangement of welfare institutions. Especially from the rapid economic growth, all the privileged resources and opportunities were pegged to the status of regular employment, particularly to the ones at the large, larger segment of firms. Secure employment, wage, privileged pension system, retirement allowance, health care, savings scheme support for house acquisition are provided by employers as incentive to employees as at the larger uh, companies. Uh, those things can be provided by states as rights in other societies. Under such specific arrangement of employment and welfare, specific culture of lifestyle and gender was developed. The culture encouraged and still actually encourages men to have strong commitment and submissive attitudes to work organization, accepting flexible requirements by companies such as flexible overtime and re regional transfer that just Peter emphasized, and to have strong sense of responsibility as a breadwinner at home. We call such culture salary man masculinity. It became dominant and legitimate culture and is monocultural as men are strongly attracted 
or are actually forced to internalize this culture. I say there is an aspect of enforcement as there were collective efforts to deny and eliminate other cultures to be men during the period of rapid economic growth. For instance, studies of masculinity provide evidences that independent mobile workers, whatever their occupations are, were labeled irresponsible or failed. And it is reported that employers and labor unions together try to deny those who have such culture and actually encourage them to have salary man masculinity. So I say the combination of employment and welfare under catching up economy strongly mobilized and actually still mobilizes men to this culture. But uh, recently, scholars expect some changes, including one that equalizes gender. Representing such expectation is the uh, debates over Frita. Are they really free from something, free from the obligation of regular workers? Or are they are just used disposable workers by companies? There are also uh, a bit of expectation about the emergence of the second standard of life course that may associate more with gender equality. However, such standard has not emerged until today. Rather, a number of empirical studies report exactly the contrary. That is the rigidity of the male breadwinner ideology. The very core of the salaryman masculinity is stronger among young non-regular workers today compared to regular workers in the same age cohort. It was clear from the start that the reforms only created new dualism in the Japanese labor market and the exclusion of non-regular employment statuses from the system that achieved catching up economy. So my talk today is rather about how young men in non-regular employment struggle to obtain recognition and legitimacy about their lives in a society. By doing so, I would like to give a partial explanation to the gender conservatism that these people show 20 years after the labor market changes. The data. Frita is uh, the name of the uh, young people, especially the young people in the non regular employment. It's a combination of the free Arbeiter, that's the German word. It's a free Arbeiter that emerged in the 1980s, I think, and the first expected to bring a new culture. But, well, as I said, it's different. <clears throat> The data I used are based on my own research done in Sapporo, Hokkaido. The largest research site was a call center. We have done interviews to employers and labor representatives, conducted questionnaire survey and interviews to both regular and non-regular employees. We have done this comprehensive research because doing questionnaire just to non-regular workers is not enough. In order to understand the world of meaning that non-regular workers live, it is necessary to know that expectations employers place on them and how regular workers think about the situation of non-regular workers, in addition to understand how non-regular workers think about themselves uh, with regard to their situations. Here, first thing we confirmed from the research is that the labor conditions of re regular and non-regular workers are really the opposite. One third of the young men uh, are in non-regular statuses in our sample. Job tenure is significantly shorter for non-regular workers, that means insecure employment in Japanese context. They earn significantly less with inferior or no corporate welfare. And in order to earn such wages, they work actually longer than regulars in our sample. That is probably the only bias of my sample. All non-regular workers in my sample work full time. This is just a visualization that regular workers have a seniority curve, but non-regular workers don't. The shocking thing that we learned from the interview was that 20 years of experience of the expansion and the entrenchment of inequality has taught people how to be indifferent to people trapped in the lower stratum. It is common to hear in interviews of regular workers that the situation, non -regular workers, situation of non-regular workers is their choice. On first sight, they say this as if they show a silent respect for non-regular workers, but it is just for the surface. Everybody interviewed knows that no regular work status is not often a choice at all, and that their em employment status may lead directly to the life of poverty and hopelessness. We can observe a social societal divide here. 
the comment, it is their choice, is the declaration of regular workers to not wanting to talk about the very apparent inequality and exclusion in contemporary Japanese society. Regular workers think that they are entitled to be on the safe side, but in order to claim this, they need to emphasize that they are more responsible than non-regular workers with regard to various organizational matters. When asked how the different treatment can be rationalized, they say we are required to fulfill obligations that non-regular workers are not. At the call center, they typically pick up the example, non-regular workers can choose time slots that they want, they want to work. When there are slots no one chose, regular workers need to fulfill the vacancy. This kind of difference was taken for granted before, but after the emergence and expansion of non-regular employment, together with the increasing necessity to justify the differentiated treatment, this sense of responsibility has come to be stressed these days. It has become a key rationale for confirming and legitimizing the privileged treatment of regular workers. Going back to non-regular work, non workers, it is interesting that different from the failing men in the past, non-regular workers today do not face with direct rejection. You know, it's their choice, people say. So, okay, but they only face with soft and unclear exclusion. This is a social environment that stigmatizes them and puts the masculinity of these young men under pressure. So how to be men under the pressure that objectively and subjectively emasculates you is the issue. No regular workers would need to gain or claim recognition and legitimacy by themselves about the situation. If there is a strong negation against them, they can locate themselves as a kind of anti-hero, but facing only soft indication that they are failing, they find an open social space in front of them where they need to fulfill with meaning by themselves. Uh, I found three types of attitudes and reactions characterized as moratorium, uh, claiming social independence, and gender conservatism. It is not to argue that there are three types of people, but I, all three can be found in one person. It is rather three dimensions of the reactions by young, non-regular men in Japan. The first is a moratorium. One guy, for example, works at the call center for long already, who is 30 years old, but he claims it is temporarily, as he wants to work in the film industry. When asked about his career, he said, oh, I'm different from others uh, because his main commitment is not the current employer. And uh, uh, that immediately put himself outside the mainstream norms. And, but at the same time, he said, um, yes, I know I'm undecided by postponing important decision on my career. I always feel that I have to do what I have to do but it is too busy to seriously think about it. I know I can't do this much longer. So he sees the current situation as a temporary state of life, preparation period on the way to achieve the real self in the future. If he's younger, this attitude can be perfectly fine, but it is, this, it is becoming to sound as an, as an attitude to avoid directly com, uh, confronting uh, against the uh, mainstream oppressive social norm. The second option to deal with the dilemma of masculinity is to present oneself as somebody emphasizing a sound work-life balance. Many non-regular men strongly emphasize the necessity or the advantage for them of being non-regular. They highlight the obligations of regular workers with regard to overtime and job transfer, both issues perceived to be hurting work-life balance in unacceptable ways. Their, choice, uh, their, claims, their claims could be legitimate but not rewarded. It is interesting that some of uh, them claim in the context that their situation is economically rational. They state, considering the wage per an hour, the non-regular wage is better than that of regular workers. I, I hear uh, lots of times of this. The emphasis on economic rationality serves as a means to present their situation as being clever, gainful, and potentially manly. However, given the information on the wages and working hours, this view is not accurate. Then why do they say this? One interpretation is that they want to emphasize differences to regular workers. They are less obedient to their employers. They can claim and earn as much as they need and want to work. Regular workers do not have this choice. All in all, it boils down to desire to claim that they are socially, if not economically, independent men. Finally, I would like to talk about gender conservatism. I think the experience of this manifests 
how desperate these men are in trying to come up with the logics of no moratorium or claiming social independence. The survey results show that the young men on the third year of 30, 39 years old agree with statistical significance more than older men to statements such as what women really want is family and child, uh, or it is a shame for men to earn less than their wives. Young men are also significant, uh, slightly more conservative on the statements such as men should work outside, women should take care of family members at home, and wives should make their husband look good in front of others. Non-regular workers are even more obsessed with breadwinner ideology than the regulars in the same age cohort. Non-regular scores higher on the uh, three statements I, I, I underlined there. At first sight, this conservatism of young men, especially of the ones in non-regular status, is astonishing. It reveals as they recognized and internalized the official norm of Japanese society. <clears throat> the reasons for this may be uh, their intention to overcome the stigma, the lack of the recognition, and legitimacy of their lives. For those non-regular status, uh, the official norm appear to be oppressing, and it is very difficult for them to claim that they are successful as a man in relation to men. Their inferior position, uh, the, this oppression, whether they are conscious about it or not, pushes them into negotiations of gender. Their inferior position in the employment welfare regime makes them gender conscious, since one of the most effective strategies to highlight their masculinity is to claim it in relation to women. So, uh, concluding notes, being employed as non-regular worker is now increasingly common among young men. Non-regular employment can only provide inferior resources and opportunity when compared to regular employment. And they experience fear and recognize the inferiority in everyday life in relation to their employers and their colleagues with regular status. Regular workers use a kind of rhetoric that shows superficial respect to the situation of non-regular workers by emphasizing that their situation is their free choice, a commonplace form of symbolic violence at the workplace today. Non-regular workers make sense of their lives, and they need to justify themselves also in relation to others. I found three ways, moratorium, social independence, and gender conservatism. The existence of these strategies reveals the very fact that young men in non-regular employment feel trapped in emasculated life courses that are stigmatizing them. Embodying breadwinner ideology more strongly than regular men reveals that the oppression makes them follow the key elements of the dominant ideology in order to gain legitimacy in the current uh, contemporary society. I will skip the concluding note mostly about the possibility of future change because time is up, I think. Yeah. But you've gone such a long way. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>